Well, now for the search for truth. Uh, the search for truth is a search that can only be undertaken once one has defeated or at least neutralized the most cogent of sophist and skeptical claims against the very possibility of truth. And in any number of the dialogues com composed by Plato, we see the skeptical position being taken head on and an attempt made to refute it. Of course, the history of skepticism is one of the most formidable in the history of philosophy. Victories over it are always tentative. There's no final and telling defeat of skepticism in every form, but there are fairly good counters to the more worrisome skeptical claims. Some of these are cogently developed in the dialogue Plato titled Mino, named after the young Athenian aristocrat, Mino, who confronts Socrates and bids him hello. Now, Mino has been uh, traveling, perhaps to Thessaly, which has a very great school of sophist teaching, as Socrates acknowledges at the very beginning of their conversation. Mino begins by asking whether virtue is acquired by teaching or by practice, or perhaps it resides within us by nature. Socrates recognizes the sophist source of, the, of questions like this, noting that one of their chief locales is the city of Larissa, which is Mino's hometown. So you see the, the knowing readers or audience for this dialogue understand what's going on here. We've got someone from a sophist background raising one of these very interesting questions, likely to undo one's interlocutor. Where does virtue come from? Is it taught? Is it in us by nature, etc.? Now, unlike the sophists who answer all such questions, Socrates declares himself to be just another ignorant Athenian. You see, I'm not from Larissa. What do I know? In thus confessing his ignorance of the subject, Socrates disappoints Mino, who asks, am I to carry that report back to Thessaly? You see, shall I go back to my home community and say this man knows nothing about this important subject? What Mino is testing is the sense in which anything can be said to be known. If it is not a subject uh, that uh, can be taught, then it must be known in some other way. But if it isn't an object that we can point to or hear or taste, then just what is it that is known? Virtue is spoken of so often and with such confidence, but what is its source? And how is it to be understood? If we don't know it by direct experience, we have no route to discovery. And if we can't define it, we really have no way of knowing just what it is we're looking for. Mino puts it this way. How will you inquire, Socrates, into that which you do not know? What will you put forth as the subject of inquiry? And if you find what you want, how will you ever know that this is the thing that you didn't know? So you begin to see the art of sophistical interrogation. Here we are, the stock sophist challenge to one who claims to be searching for the truth. The search is shown to be an idle activity, and we can safely abandon such futile projects and get on with the serious business of life. Now, Mino is attended by a servant boy, a young servant in some translations a slave, a lulos, uh, a young servant described by Mino himself as a barbarian. And we want to recall the sense that we attach to the term barbarian when the ancient Greek writers use it. They are not referring inevitably to someone in a loincloth with uh, straggly hair and uh, grunting in no known form of language. Rather, they are referring to a non-Greek speaker, to someone who is not part of the Hellenic culture to someone outside the bounds of Hellenic Paideia. The Greeks did have a rather uppity attitude toward the non-Hellenic world. This was based on their own judgment that the non-Hellenic cultures had not achieved anything on the order of what the Hellenes had achieved, and therefore they should enjoy some pride of place when it comes to philosophy, the rule of law, the idea and realization of beauty, etc. Uh, one might say, to some extent, an earned uppityness. Nonetheless, there was a full appreciation of the fact that these different cultures produced persons of great power and nobility. 
the Greeks had been defeated often enough by alien cultures not to underestimate the abilities of their adversaries or their friendly neighbors, whether those were in Egypt or Persia or elsewhere in the known world. So to refer to someone as a barbarian is not to refer to someone of an inferior stripe except in the cultural sense. Well, Socrates asks Mino if it's all right for him to ask this young servant boy some questions. Um, by the way, has he had any education? And of course, Mino says, no, no formal education. Uh, does he know mathematics? Well, of course he doesn't know mathematics. Barbarians don't uh, spend a lot of time learning mathematics. Well, this much established, Socrates calls the boy over, and as he engages him in a kind of colloquy, Socrates starts sketching some figures in the sand. Now, we have a good idea of the sorts of things he was sketching. He asks the boy whether he realizes that if this is the case, then that's the case, and if this is so, then wouldn't that be so, and this goes on for a time. As the interrogation proceeds, it becomes quite apparent that the boy recognizes certain quite basic relationships of a mathematical nature, indeed of a geometric nature. And in the culminating series of questions, this now depending on how one interprets just what it was that Socrates was drawing in the sand, we're led toward the conclusion, perhaps tentative, but we are led toward the conclusion that the boy appreciates the fact that the area of a square is uniquely determined by the length of a diagonal drawn through it. Which is to say, the boy comprehends the truth of what? The Pythagorean theorem. Well, this is a very interesting discovery that Socrates has made, although Socrates knew all along what the outcome was going to be. And he then says to Mino, well now, did I give him the answer to this problem? Did I solve it for him? No. No, you didn't solve it for him. Well, is this something he learned in school? Was this in a course of studies completed or something he learned from tapes from the teaching company, etc.? No, no, it wasn't anything like that at all. So then the question that naturally arises is, well, how does he know it? What's the source of this knowledge? You can imagine the, the surprise here now. You've, you've asked a young servant, a slave, all sorts of questions. You reach the defensible conclusion that the slave, without any benefit of instruction, seems to comprehend the Pythagorean theorem. How so? Socrates sets out to answer his own question. The answer to the question, how does Mino's servant know the Pythagorean theorem, is that, in a certain sense, Mino's servant always knew it. That what was called for here was not for Mino's servant to learn something, but for him to recall something. Here in the dialogue we get a particularly clear version of that famous platonic solution to the problem of knowledge. Knowledge as a form of reminiscence. Plato's is indeed a reminiscence theory regarding what is true. At this point, however, it's important to distinguish between knowledge as an awareness of mere facts in the world and the enduring truths that stand behind what are otherwise mere appearances. To know the facts of the world, Socrates, and nearly every other philosopher, would suggest that you simply open your eyes, listen, walk around, and otherwise exercise the powers of perception. But truth is something different from fact. Recall the Pythagorean position. Truth is that which does not change. It is that which is eternal. It's not part of the ephemera of daily experience. It's something that abides. What is true must always have been true. It always will be true. Therefore, it is removed from the domain of purely sensory experience. It's removed from the domain of mere materiality. So this is now truth with a capital T, as opposed to facts with a lowercase f. Such knowledge, knowledge of this kind of truth, could not possibly come about by way of perception. For everything we know that comes about as a result of the world making contact with sense organs, well, that can only be material things because the sense organs themselves are material. The world is a collection of material objects, the sense organs themselves material objects, so at the experiential level 
what one has is an interaction between matter and matter. And of course, everything that is material is constantly in a state of flux. Heraclitus put it very well. If he, Heraclitus had uh, written in Latin, he would have said, Nemo descensit bis in idem fluminem. No one descends twice into the same river. We usually render this in Latin, by the way. Nemo is no one. Captain Nemo is nobody. Now, the Heraclitian theory of the fluxes is a theory about the constant changing nature of what we would call the real world. To accept this is to be skeptical in the matter of perceptually based knowledge. If everything is in a state of flux, any knowledge claim we make can only be good for the moment. This might be a valid knowledge claim about the facts of the world, but surely not about ultimate truths judged to be unchanging and eternal. Well, if such knowledge cannot be gained as a result of direct perception, how does one come to have it? Ah, well, one has it, as it were, intuitively. That is, the soul, in some sense, possesses a certain power of comprehension, a certain reservoir of root understandings about ultimate reality, about ultimate truth. Now, one of Plato's debts to Pythagorean teaching is belief in the transmigration of souls. The proposition that there is some animating principle within us, some feature of psyche, which we translate as soul, that is immaterial, abiding, it predates the birth and persists after the death of the corporeal being. Through its repeated incarnations, it comes to possess a knowledge that no single person could command. With the death of the body, the soul is liberated. We find several times in the dialogues, in, in, in the Greek now, a play on words. Soma, sima. Soma is the body. Sima is a kind of prison cell. And the idea of the body now as a desmoterion, a kind of penitentiary, uh, the body is a place that has shackled the soul during earthly life, and death brings liberation of the soul, and therefore the possibility of the soul recovering and gathering pure knowledge, which is its proper inheritance. If you are sensing some anticipation of Christian teaching in this, you're on the right track. Well, much of this is at work in the dialogue Mino. What Mino's servant is doing is, by way of philosophical guidance, reaching into a level of intuitive knowledge that is otherwise clouded by sensory experience, distorted by the mere facts of the world. As long as Mino's servant is, is allowing his soul to be occupied by the flotsam of perception, he would never arrive at these understandings. So we have then this answer, as it were, to the skepticism that is uh, inherent in much of Sophist teaching and inherent in much of the teaching of the cynics, inherent in much of pre-Socratic philosophy. It's inherent in theories of fluxes, the constant change in the world, the changeable character of all things that exist, leaving us in the lurch with respect to knowing anything definite about it, anything you could really count on. I say this is all an answer to that. The other obvious debt to Pythagoras is in the very example that Socrates chooses when he brings the servant boy over and starts drawing figures in the sand. What is it he wants this to lead to? But a recognition on the part of Mino that what the boy understands is the Pythagorean theorem. Now, recall that the true rectilinear triangle is not something drawn. We've been over that. It's not something physical or material. The true rectilinear triangle is what is instantiated by a mathematical relationship. Remember Pythagoras and the divinity of number. A mathematical relationship which undergoes no change, whatever, because there isn't anything material about it. To the extent that a rectilinear triangle is a physical object, it's changing all the time. To the extent that it's a fundamental mathematical relationship, that doesn't change at all. a square plus b square equals c square is the relational statement that just is the rectilinear triangle. 
Now, drawn figures, drawn in sand or drawn on papyrus or drawn on paper, these are changeable sorts of things. They exist in a world of flux, wherein the soul is distracted from its proper course. We must make a distinction between a drawn triangle and the true form. The drawn triangle is an empirical thing, accessible to the senses, inevitably undergoing change and degeneration and ultimate destruction. The true form, the true form of the rectilinear triangle suffers no such fate. A squared plus B squared equals C squared was a truth that predates human history. You wouldn't ask the question, on what date did the Pythagorean theorem become valid? It's a truth that will remain when the last human being has disappeared from the face of the earth and the cosmos has suffered the heat death, depending on which of the cosmological theories you find most appealing, or in this case, perhaps least appealing. On the understanding that everything, everything that exists is finally going to approach that maximally entropic state in which there is homogeneous distribution of an infinity of little particles spread out through a spaceless universe, even on that understanding, what? A squared plus B squared equals C squared. It remains true. Now what is it about the soul that can allow it to make contact with a truth of that kind? What is it about our rationality that can make contact with something like that? Well, you begin to see immediately that it can't be something about the psychology of the individual that is perceptual that's going to be able to do this. It can't be the retina that's doing this. Surely Pythagoras did not arrive at that theorem by laying his measuring rod along various right-angle triangles, happily and luckily finding the first one to be a three, four, five triangle, which, which would make the arithmetic come out quite neatly. Surely, except for the three, four, five rectilinear triangle, it would be unlikely that measurement would generate such a theorem. Three squared plus four squared does equal five squared, but matters become very, very difficult when, when different combinations of numbers are, are used. Consider a case where the altitude of the triangle happens to be 6.37 inches and the base happens to be 2.4436 inches. Well, you begin to see this turns out to be a rather difficult thing. You, you might even need, need a computer for this if you're trying to arrive at a theorem like that empirically. Similarly, with pi, you don't come up with 3.1416 forever and ever and ever as a result of some experiential undertaking. Because that is an experience that would have to go on for all eternity, just as pi is a series of numbers that would go on for all eternity. So you don't come up with transcendental numbers or imaginary numbers and the like experientially. Nothing in the realm of fact is the square root of minus one. Now, where do these notions come from then, since they don't come from experience on, on this argument or analysis? Well, obviously, they must be there in a sense, in, in some a priori way, which doesn't necessarily mean temporally prior to experience, but as it were, logically or conceptually prior to experience, as there is nothing in experience that will convey something like this. Nothing in experience will convey square root of minus one. And as rational beings are clearly in possession of ideas like this, they must be in possession of these ideas independently of experience. Again, this is an intuitionist, as it were, an intuitionist's theory of knowledge, a theory of knowledge based on the proposition that what is firmly known and known to be true, and that which could not possibly be known as a result of experience, must be part of the very gift of rationality itself. It must be something coextensive with the life and thought of a rational being. Now on the Platonic account, and here let me pause for a moment and clarify what I mean by the Platonic account. Uh, the dialogues of Plato have been categorized by scholars into three periods, the so-called early middle and late dialogues. Ideas firmly espoused in the early dialogues sometimes are modified and even rejected later. 
So to refer to the Platonic position generally requires us to say whether this is early Plato or middle Plato or middle Plato or late Plato. Note, for example, Aristotle's comments on, on Platonic teaching, and he had been exposed to it for 20 years. Aristotle insists that it was not Socrates, but Socrates' disciples who conferred ontological standing on the true forms, that it was never Socrates' view that there is some really existing true form of the right angle triangle over and against, do you see, uh, particular three-sided figures that have one angle that's 90 degrees. So Aristotle is of the view that the original Socratic teaching was that something like the rectilinear triangle is the formal representation of what actually exists in the concrete but that the formal mathematical representation doesn't have some independent kind of floating cosmic existence. This at least is Aristotle making a distinction between Socrates' actual teaching and what the Socratics uh, are found to be affirming in Plato's dialogues. Now, I don't want to broker the competing claims of Aristotle and writers in the Platonist tradition on the matter of just what Socrates' last word might have been on, on this subject. But I say as early as Aristotle's own writing, we see the controversial claim that teachings of Socrates were transformed by his students and may not be reliable guides to Socrates' own thought. The dialogues themselves may not be reliable guides as to precisely what Socrates' own position was. And this is part of the general Socrates-Plato question. How much of the dialogues is, is Socratic? How much is Platonic? There's a Platonic Socrates and a Socratic Plato. The, these are matters that we have fun with late at night and not so much right now. I don't plan to make these fine distinctions here, quite apart from the fact that much time really would be consumed by attempts to make these distinctions uh, is the more fundamental consideration. When what is at issue is one of the great ideas in the history of philosophy, it's far less important to determine what Socrates really believed than it is to determine whether the proposition is true and defensible. What Socrates' personal position might have been on whether or not true forms have bona fide ontological standing or whether the true form simply refers to an abstract representation of that which can only exist in experience is for Xenophon or some later biographer of Socrates to figure out. But whether or not true forms in that platonic sense can legitimately be regarded as having some kind of ontological standing, some sort of real immaterial existence in the domain of actual things is a philosophical proposition worth our attention. Again, whether Socrates finally subscribed to the view or not. Now if we take the position that mathematics is just the right model for getting at the truth, capital T, that is the, that truth inevitably refers to that which is an unchanging form, and that ready to hand is an abstract mathematics that vindicates that very belief, we may make progress in dealing with all of the problems of knowledge. So if the skeptic says, how can you possibly stand behind the proposition that there is such a thing as unchanging truth? Well, one reply will present the truths of mathematics. You just say, well, if you doubt there can be any truth at all, get out Euclid or get a trigonometry book or a, 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 a calculus text, you see. Now, of course, there are rebuttals to that, to that rebuttal or that riposte. And we will be confronting these in the course of, uh, of uh, later lectures. One, one can turn around in the spirit of David Hume and say, well, yes, there are these mathematical truths, but these are, these are really truths about words, not truths about anything having real existence. I say we'll get into revived forms of skepticism and indeed firm defenses of empiricistic alternatives to the account discussed here. But Plato was satisfied that the truths of mathematics were sufficient to put skepticism itself on notice. There really do seem to be things that can be known certainly, and mathematics has established that these things can be known with certainty, 
So the problem of knowledge now becomes understood as a search for the kinds of truths that will match up with mathematical certainties. We should be looking for relational truths of the sort instantiated, for example, by the Pythagorean theorem. The true right angle triangle is expressed by this theorem, which is the triangle's true form as distinct from sketched three-sided figures observable through perception. The former, the true form, is immutable. And the latter is what? It's a pure counterfeit. Now, if the true form of something cannot be reached through experience, what's left? Well, what's left is an essentially rational enterprise. Not an experiential enterprise, but a rational enterprise. And what form must this rational enterprise take? It takes a form which, in the Greek, is referred to, the Greek term for it, as the alenkis, a dialectical or argumentative approach, but not argumentative at the level of rhetoric. It's an approach that sets out simply to show your adversary um, is a dunce or dullard. It, uh, it, it's a bona fide search for truth, not a search for victory, where, where the rhetorician or the sophist might want to show an adversary to be a dunce, one engaged in the Alenkis is really trying to get at what really is the case without showing anybody up. We're all in this together. Let's argue it through. Now, I should say, as I said in a previous lecture, that it's quite easy to libel the sophists in this regard. There, there were members of the sophist teaching fraternity, of course. One who comes to mind and who figures in Plato's Republic is Thrasymachus who taught for pay and who seemed to be engaged in a set of argumentative ploys that were rather showy and I should think intended chiefly to reduce one's uh, interlocutor to utter confusion and make him seem like a, an utter dunce. But the original sophist school included men of great intellectual integrity who were not indifferent or hostile to the idea of truth but were wary of claims to the effect that it's within our reach. The argumentative or dialectical approach is not simply a rhetorical device. I want to emphasize that. It's an investigative device. Through the philosophical mode of investigation, we come to consult whatever is, whatever is contained within the rational resources of the soul itself. As it were, we talk our way into this domain. It's the only thing we've got because experience is not going to count for anything here. The truths we're looking for can't be held up and shown to anyone. So we're going to have to discover them how? We're probably going to have to discover them the way Pythagoras must have discovered the Pythagorean theorem. Surely not by running around and measuring three-sided figures, but by engaging in a kind of internal contemplative discourse within the soul itself a kind of introspective, maybe spiritually guided form of inquiry into what Aristotle will call first things. The philosopher has committed himself to an inquiry of that kind. And what it means to be a disciple or student of a philosopher is just to be one who is prepared to cast oneself as an acute listener, the right sort of conversationalist, on a journey the end of which is a form of knowledge attained by me no servant. The end is less a discovery of what has never been known than the uncovering of what has always been possessed but lost in the hurly-burly, in the flotsam and distraction of daily perceptual, sensory, sensual life. So we have at once, if not a solution to the problem of knowledge, a recognition of just what it is that makes knowledge problematical. Knowledge is problematical owing to this slavish reliance on experience, as if experience could teach us things like this. Clearly every man, woman, and child, as well as most of the creatures of the animal kingdom, have experiences minute by minute, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and yet the world is home to villains and fools, a few wise men, distracted people, the mad, the weird, the mentally deficient. There's a panoply of human types and types of lives, and it's idle to attempt to discriminate between or within groups such as these on the basis of experience. 
for experience is ubiquitous. The villains of history are rich in their experiential backgrounds. And few saints we've ever known are rich in their, or are any richer in their experiential background, perhaps not very rich at all. Well, the point is this. You can't make distinctions between the wise and the foolish on the basis of who has more experience. And if you can't make distinctions between the wise and the foolish on that, on that basis, then on what basis will you make the distinction? That is to say, to add up that which itself never reaches the fundamental truths is to engage in an enterprise that is entirely nugatory. Well then, the experiences of 11 people would not amount to anything versus the experiences of one. And if the experiences of 11,000 amount to no more than the experiences of one, the implications for democratic or majoritarian rule are clear. You begin to see then that Socrates is going to get in trouble in the radically Athenian state in which he finds himself.